Um, we're talking, of course, about pseudoscience. Um, fraudulent and unsafe practices that claim to be science-based, they're proliferating across the internet, but what are the most dangerous claims being shared and how can they be addressed? Um, I can't think of a more timely um, uh, entry point to this conversation than a press release that we put out only a couple of days ago on the subject of climate science. Now, we, we um, through a global opinion poll that we conduct every year, we found that actually trust in climate science is actually declining year on year. So much as we're uh, elevating the subject as leaders here in Davos, um, as something which is more urgent than ever, needs addressing more and more than ever, that message is failing to cut through. Now, we may not have the expertise specifically to talk about climate change, but the whole kind of concept of super pseudoscience, I think, is relevant. Let's find out. So, um, I'm not the expert. You've probably guessed it already. Um, Lisa Sanders, you are an expert. You're an associate <laughs> professor at Yale University. You're a physician. You're also a columnist uh, writing the diagnosis column in the New York Times. Robert D. Graf, you're a director and a Leon Levy professor the Institute for Advanced Studies in uh, the USA. You're a theoretical physicist and a string theorist. Um, so, Robert, let's start with you. Why are we getting it wrong? Why is pseudoscience winning? Um, well, there are many reasons. I think no, there is, pseudoscience is, might be winning because there are some real adversarial efforts. So people, I mean, one thing we see is that science is becoming more and more important. It's more and more steering our decisions. It's underpinning our policies. So it has immediate effects. And we have to be realistic. There are some forces who uh, don't like this. And this is something we have seen before. Uh, we have seen it during the, uh, so to say, the tobacco wars when the health impacts of smoking came. We have seen it in the envir environmental issues. I think uh, climate science and climate change is a, is a, is a great example uh, where you see these kind of efforts by a certain lobby organization. But also I think there's something else going on, which is that you know, I would almost want to say that is a little bit the glass half full attitude is that people are in general more knowledgeable, uh, knowledge spreads faster through the internet. So there's something happening, what I would like to call almost like a proto-scientist in people. People are trying to investigate themselves. And, um, and I have obviously great difficulty in fully grasping all the complexities of the issue. And you know, all of these issues are, uh, as any scientific topic, it's about the facts, but it's also about the uncertainties. And there's a very strange, particularly for climate, I think there's a very strange psychological effect. I would say almost in every element of life, we want to have almost like a 100% guarantee that things do not go wrong. It seemed to be that for climate, we want to have a 100% guarantee that things do go wrong. And so, which is very crazy, what if you would like board a plane and you would say, well, it's, it has a 90% chance of crashing. Nobody would ever board that plane. If you talk about the planets, then people say, well, wait a moment, there's still 10% that uh, has to be investigated. <laughs> and so let's do a little bit more research. And I think that's something that people are struggling with. And you know, in terms of the broader discussion, it's, we, I think we have to prepare that these issues will stay with us. Because clearly, there's a whole new series of important scientific development, technological developments that will impact us, that will have the same complexity, the same kind of impact as uh, climate change has. Well, I imagine, I, I imagine that the complexity will only increase. Yes. It's going one way. But I'm, I'm fa fascinated by the suggestion that as we all become proto-scientists, the more knowledge we acquire, the more we are inclined to get wrong. Yes, well, there's something, I mean, and, and, and I must say that another interesting element of this is that now, we can debate this, but the wonderful thing is no scientists can also study this. So people are studying how we communicate science, how we are uh, dealing with these issues. And one counterintuitive fact, but it seemed to be um, quite universal, is that if you learn more about it, your opinions harden. So the most obvious solution to this to many scientists is, well, I just spread more information, I explain it to you again and again and again and again. But this seemed to have kind of an adverse effect. So um, it's something that we have to address probably in a smarter way. And I hope that the other sciences, and this is, of course, I'm myself a physicist. This is something that social scientists, etc., uh, study, communication scientists. So I think, you know, as a whole scientific body, is something that we probably can find smarter ways to counter these forces.
which I feel will only grow in time. So that's really important. Uh, we'll come to how to address here, but first, uh, please, what, what are your, what, what's your uh, experience as you're in, on the medical side of the, of the debate? Well, I think that there, in addition to the more you know, the more solidified your belief system gets, I think there's also like a growing uh, sort of skepticism about what the authorities say. There's sort of an anti-authoritarianism, mm -hmm. even as we move towards authoritarianism in my country, <laughs> but uh, there's a kind Kind of a distrust of authority that makes people go, oh yeah, I don't think so. Um, that I don't really understand where it's coming from, but you certainly see it all the time. Uh, when you look at vaccines, it's, it's been well studied. The more people, the more you try to educate people when they've done studies, the less likely they are to change their minds. And actually, some people move from being, oh sure, vaccines are fine, everybody does it, to, oh, I don't no, maybe I don't want to have my child vaccinated with the application of more information. So I don't, I don't think we really understand how this all works, but it's certainly having a devastating effect on all of us. And I encourage as much interaction as possible. The, those of you watching live online, I've taken some questions from, from Twitter this morning, but please, if you have any questions or disagree, we love disagreement, please do stick your hand up. Um, or or Lisa, perhaps we're just in a unique moment in history where the uh, the whole mushrooming of the you know the digital world has has caught everybody's surprise, and there are just so many ways to manipulate people's opinions that maybe those loopholes will get closed. I was reading, of course, part of my preparation. Um, YouTube, I believe it uh, it is that said it's uh, uh, the number of um, it's dropped a number of uh, fake referrals by 50 percent year on, uh, in the past year. Fact checkers are being recruited en masse by the big social media platforms. So it seems maybe there is a plan in place. And yeah, this is just a unique period of history where we're just struggling to, to you know, as always, catch up with people who are finding ways of abusing and, and exploiting um, frailties in our digital ecosystem. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that you have to be pretty sophisticated to tell the difference between what's true in science and the people who set out fake stuff in science. I mean, they have like, they come from different institutes and they're published in all these different papers and they have all these fancy letters after their names. So they look like, they use the right language or language that sounds scientific. So they have a simulacrum of reality or truth that's it's not true. Well, it's also good to realize that we have been here before, right? Be before the advent of modern science, everything was fake science, right? So it's not uh, like what's called, <laughs> now we call it alchemy or whatever. And you see when the printing press came, we think, oh wow, this now certainly, you know, authorized knowledge was distributed, but actually there was like incredible amount of spam in the 16th and 17th century. There were pamphlets, there were obscure texts, uh, a very, very minute fraction was Newton's Principia or something. Uh, and so, and exactly what you were just saying happened, of course, there was a kind of weaving out process and a scientific literature was established. So, and in retrospect, we say wonderful, because before that, there was a very dogmatic point of view. So the fact that people were challenged to think for themselves, that the scientific method showed them, well, you can actually see with your own eyes how things work instead of just hearing. In, in math, we sometimes talk about proof by intimidation. And I think that's a very bad way to present science. So I think there are some kind of correcting mechanisms, but it was a painful process. And um, in some sense, the, this, the communication means have been disrupted again. Mine of, one of my colleagues uh, had this wonderful phrase that uh, the, problem with the, the problem with the global village are the global village idiots. <laughs> and uh, so they, they now can spread, no, and it's so right what you say, you know, it's sometimes very clever. Um, they pick the acronyms, which are close cousins of the established organizations. And I must say also the media play a very important role because often these things are discussed in a way where media feels that it should be kind of two-sided, so it should give a fair chance. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, you would have, say, 98% of all climate scientists, and it will be a representative who has to obey to the rules that science imposes. So be very careful with your statements. On the other side, there's somebody who's like completely devoid of the facts and can play as, as dirty as you want. And you know, it's a debate, and I would say almost invariably such a debate ends in a draw. 
which actually will be a loss for science. And I find very refreshing that now some news organizations have decided, I think the BBC recently, we're not always going to show, show the other side, because it's, that's kind of complete nonsense. You know, if, if we debate gravity, you're not asking an anti-gravity person to sit on the other side and talk about, you know, whatever crazy ideas. No, we just know it's a law of nature. And we, we do have these, I can't tell whether it's just the media or if it really is a proliferation of people who believe in crazy things like, you know, this whole flat earth thing. It's hard to imagine how anybody could go for that. And, and maybe it's really only two people who know how to uh, manipulate the media. Maybe better. they tell a better story than the scientists. Maybe, people, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's more interesting to believe this stuff, this, stuff, this, this, this nonsense. I, well, I maybe, maybe you guys aren't telling the story correct. And I can't believe that it's only commercial interests that drive this. You know, certainly in climate change, there yes. are people who are obviously have a lot to lose. But like anti-vax, who's profiting from that really? One guy yeah, is still, his study still got, you know, kicked yes. out of the journal. You know, if you go to that page, you can see it has a big stamp over it that says, you know, discredited. But if vaccinations, and I'm, I'm not at all an expert, but I find kind of an interesting debate because some people say, well, wait a moment, uh, there are many other viruses, etc. Should we vaccinate against everything? And are there some in, unintended consequences? So they, they put some question marks. And I think putting the question marks is fine. But for instance, measles is a good example, right? So recent, uh, you know much more about it, that recent insight show that, you know, if you, if you get the measles, if you survive, it's basically a total reset of your immune system. So it has devastating consequences. So you can say, well, whatever your doubts are, there are a few vaccines that you should take anyhow, because you can make the case much stronger. So I think there's this, this, this kind of natural quest that people have, they're they, they, they are doubting, they're questioning certain elements. I think, you know, as a scientific community, we can have a real balanced and meaningful answers to that. Right. And of course, measles is a great example because that is the most contagious disease that I know of. You know, I mean, if you, if somebody breathes or sneezes in a room, those measles, you know, vaccine, uh, you know, uh, viruses stay airborne for hours. Nobody else, no other disease does that. So, I mean, it is, if you, there's one person in a room with 100 other people, then there's a very good chance that 10 of those people are going to get the measles. That's insane. So if you're going to make, and I think that that's a reasonable way to go, you know, um, I'm sorry I gave my kids the chickenpox vaccine because, of course, now that they're in their 20s, it's not working. So, um, so there are some things that were less useful, but measles, tetanus, you know, mumps. I mean, the reason that people were at least initially against it, uh, doing it, because why do we need it? Nobody has these things anymore. Well, that is not the case now. Tough questions. We're kind of reaching the halfway, the halfway stage. Anyone? Gentleman here, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Alejandro, medical doctor from Colombia and part of the Global Shapers community in Colombia. So uh, I wanted to, to touch on the point on the cultural differences and maybe the differences in on critically appraising science between you know high income countries and middle and low income countries because it seems that for some of the active uh, anti vaccine movement that could be very much uh, a, an issue of high income countries so what are your takes on on these differences between these cultural backgrounds good point couple of cultural differences and Oh, I, I know, for, uh, for instance, there's a lot of uh, research being done with uh, uh, global warming and the attitudes there. And it's quite remarkable. So there are two things you can measure, uh, how much people are aware of the issues and how much they feel that action should be taken. And uh, if you look around the globe, you see all possible combinations. So, for instance, one thing we see typically in the global south, that people initially are less aware of it, but the moment they become aware, they also want to take action. So there's very little climate skepticism. Um, I think countries, uh, I think like Latin America and Japan, they are both aware and they want to take action. North America is in some sense really an, an exception to the rule. And even I think within Europe, you see local differences. So in that sense, we think that science is a universal language. So we are describing a universal effect, namely how that language is learned and appreciated. You're quite right to point out that a lot of cultural differences. So I think if we want to address these issues, we also have to be aware of what the, the local culture is, culture in terms of uh, 
you know, it, in some sense, it's very history dependent how people, what their, uh, what the position of science is in a particular uh, country or community, uh, how people should be addressed, how they uh, feel with respect to authority. So I strongly feel this, this has a very regional and cultural um, coloring, both in the effect and how it has to be addressed. And I think we did a pretty poor job in many cases of introducing, trying to sell the idea of vaccines. We just thought, we're big, we're America, we're Europe, we're scientists, this is the right thing to do, and just said, we should do this. And then funding you know, programs to vaccinate everybody without really thinking about uh, these people have opinions of their own. Uh, and we have to convince people that it's the right thing to do. We can't just say, do this, and expect them to jump, because I believe that we have a history that's filled with wickedness you know, in the past. And so people are maybe rightfully skeptical. And I think we didn't do a good job, a good enough job, of convincing people. Uh, and perhaps there's an element of um, uh, data literacy here as well. Maybe, mm. may, maybe the, the more informed you are about spotting fake news online or misinformation online, but maybe, maybe that kind of digital literacy is going to be a big help in, uh, in, addressing, in addressing such concerns as pseudoscience in, in, in less developed parts of the world. Maybe, but you know, there's a lot of research that says we believe things not because we're convinced by the science, because we don't really, you know, as in medicine in particular, we're terrible at math. I mean, so we pretend like we have these conversations about evidence-based medicine, but we don't really do them. We don't really feel comfortable with the math. So I, I, I think that um, it's it's been difficult, you know, and I don't know. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I actually want to kind of almost use the metaphor of uh, vaccines and vaccinations and viruses a little bit because I think uh, part of all of this is, is kind of building kind of an intellectual immune system. You know, we have to uh, be able to react to this kind of infiltration of fake news. And one thing I think we can learn from political scientists they've studied various kind of environments and they found that environments that are. Uh, pluralistic, where you, like in the US, would bo both watch CNN and Fox News, and where people in some sense have to kind of exercise their, their brains, if I can say it like that, have to, the critical thinking, mm. that they are more politically engaged. So there's a, that, that's a one-to-one -one correlation. And I feel that perhaps we have been a bit um, negligent, also I think from the scientific community, to uh, build that immune system. I mean, in some sense, we have almost done but you know, leaving children in a sterile environment. We think if you just are, just are fed the facts that you will appreciate science. I think that you need a certain kind of messiness. Hmm. I think you have to train people in their critical thinking because whatever is happening now with these topics of anti-vaxxers or climate deniers, there will be a next crisis, there will be a next topic, hmm. and people are equally ignorant. So the good thing of uh, you know, vaccinations or, or having an infection is that you build up antibodies to uh, resist the next. And I think that's something that we have to do. So it's, it's something much broader than this one topic. So I don't think by just learning more about the climate or learning more about the body will immunize ourselves to the next debate, which might be about AI or about quantum technology or, or something that yes, yet has to be invented. Uh, and, but there are, there's, there's, there are some kind of general skills, um, which I think, again, go to the heart of science, mm -hmm. is to you know, actually look at the evidence, think critically about it, deal with uncertainties. And you know, that should be part of our literacy. literacy. Mm -hmm. And indeed, dealing with data is a crucial part of that. I just get, get back, uh, I'm just, uh, let me just kind of think about what you said earlier, though, about the, the kind of proto-scientists and the more balance you give, the more ambiguity you create and the more room for uh, people to a, be fed the wrong conclusion or draw the wrong conclusion too. So getting that balance right, can you think of any good successful examples of where um, beliefs have been successfully shifted or influences, influen you know, behaviours have been influenced successfully and, and, and have, you, have you been able to identify why and what was being done differently in those situations in either of your respective fields? I think tobacco, clearly. you know. Um, 
took a long time. It took Lots a long time. Died. It took a long time. It took yes. a lot of life, lives. But, you know, I think that there's no one who thinks that the tobacco companies were right. Uh, and it took a lot it took a lot of stuff coming out from uh, their uh, from their records being through lawsuits. But I think your idea of an intellectual immune system is a really powerful metaphor because uh, one of the things we know is that people don't actually form their own opinions. They sort of take on the opinions of the people around them. Yes. And if you could maybe uh, try to deal with it on, on that sort of metaphorical level. You know, when I was a kid, we used to have chicken pox parties. So they would, every, whoever had the chicken pox, there would be a party at their house, and then we would all get the chicken pox. Um, and I wonder if there's a way to sort of identify people who are going to be the right people to spread a message and targeting those people rather than trying to target everybody. Because even people who want to understand numbers and science and that all that literature, it's going to be hard for them. It's hard for me. Um, so there's got to be a way to spread it in a different way. So you're, you're, talking, you're talking about you know, recruiting influencers to help spread that message. Oh my God, how terrible. Yes, I think I am. <laughs> Well, I mean, in some sense, we're saying that there are fake scientists learn from science and they, they, they try to replicate uh, the, the at least, you know, on a superficial way. But, you know, we, we can cl clearly also learn from what's successful in spreading fake science. I must say, just to push the discussion a little bit to the negative, perhaps, you know, if you... But the thing I worry about is that, you know, there are two things we certainly know, that like, science will progress and it will dig deeper and it will be more complicated. And um, so it will be more difficult to understand. The science in 100 years will probably be totally unknowledgeable from the present point of view. And yet, at the same time, its impact will be bigger because, because of all that details. So the big risk is that we move into a society that's completely ignorant and totally in the grips of science. And so that gap that knowledge gap, that human gap, has to be bridged. And so we have to really think uh, of building that bridge. And I think it's not just the, the general public on one side and the scientists on the other side. I think we need intermediaries. We have to think about how to spread the knowledge, how to educate. Um, I th certainly, I think, from the point of view of science, we need kind of bridgeheads on the other side, people in the media, people in policy that are willing to play this, these roles. And I think there's a lot of knowledge in people who build the digital infrastructure, who know about communication, etc., that can help. In the end, I think these processes could help also to bridge that gap, which is actually, I think, you know, a very fearsome uh, development. Um, let's just, very, very little time left, which is a, a great shame, because um, we're only just getting started, this is fascinating. But let's just think about the uh, role of government here and the good old clunky old-fashioned top-down approach of of regulation for example so we're seeing more and more countries um, um, making vaccination le uh, you know you know legally enforceable and enforcing it um, is that going to be effective well you know one of the things that happened with vaccination in this country is that the number of exceptions grew and grew and grew and then there's there, so you can get it for religious and personal reasons, all kinds of reasons that you can choose not to get your ch children vaccinated. And the more exceptions there are, the fewer the children are that get vaccinated. There is one state, it's either Mississippi or Alabama, they're next to each other and I get them confused, <clears throat> that long ago said everybody has to be vaccinated before they start public schools, no exceptions, period. And they have the highest rate of vaccination in the country, higher than, and this is a place that's not well known for their education, mm -hmm. for their valuing of science. It was just a rule, everybody did it. Um, and so I think that there is a role for government to be inflexible like that. We have this good that you wanna participate in, public education, this is the price you have to pay for it. I totally agree, There's, there, there, I mean, one of the, uh sometimes a really kind of depressing thought is that we have to fight this battle again and again, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. 
we did not talk mostly about climate change and vaccinations, but we had tobacco, we had you know, nuclear energy, there's so many issues. And unfortunately, I think it's sometimes also in the scientific community, it's siloed. So the stories and the methods and the experience are not shared. But also think about tobacco. You know, how, uh, what was really important here? It was government regulations. It's kind of uh, forbidding smoking in public, uh, public rooms, uh, taxes. And, and tobacco, I think, also shows that you know, it's very difficult to get a 100% buy-in. Uh, there's still 10, 20%, some countries more, people who smoke. And they are totally aware of the risks. So I think, you know, I'm, at some point, we also should be fine with it. You know? I, I don't think I feel we should say, well, we only go, uh, the vaccination is different, but you know, for, for to be active in climate, say so we wait till we got the last person convinced and we get 100% buy-in. Probably you will never get that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're quite right. In the end, it's top-down efforts that really make the difference. I think in educating the media, I mean, I think the media sort of has stumbled around without recognizing their power and how much it's changed. Um, and I think that they just haven't been, they haven't kept up with it. You know, there's this idea um, this Jeffersonian idea that the way to, or Madison, the way to fight bad ideas is with more ideas. Um, and they just feel like, well, we'll just keep, what you said, we'll just keep pushing it out there and people will eventually be beaten into submission. But that doesn't work. And I think that, and, and this fairism also, this uh, uh, both sidesism, mm -hmm. I, think they're, I think they're slowly getting over that. I, I, I love this. We're coming down in favor of, <laughs> in favor of uh, a media that is very much controlling of the message rather than exploring a, a balanced reportage. Fascinating. Um, a mix of hard and soft power, one could say. Uh, the strong arm of the law, but also um, clever, sophisticated ways of influencing people and recruiting influencers to bridge yes. the scientific community. Yes. As you're creating all this knowledge, other people are following in your wake, using it for nefarious purposes. Fascinating conversation. I would love to have for us to stay longer, but unfortunately, we've come to an end already. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much.